everyone. We are live here on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel. My name is Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, and with me today is my daughter, Maisie. Hello. And Maisie is going to be moderating the chat. She's chatting uh, as me in the chat. So if you have any questions, type the word question in all caps, and then type your question normally afterwards. If you do the whole thing in caps, YouTube kicks it out like it's a, a spam comment. So um, and then she will ask questions to me or one of the other moderators in the chat will help you out. We are going to paint this today. It is a, um, uh, a like a temple on a hill with some mountains in the background. I thought it was really pretty and it's actually really easy. And there's a pattern that you can print out on my blog as well as a reference photo so that you can um, you can have that in front of you. Like I take mine, I'll show you here. I take mine right to my little uh, shelf in front of me so I can look at it. Gorgeous photo from Pexels. And um, you can set up so that you can paint watching the video and having that reference photo. Um, and if you like landscapes, you may enjoy, you might enjoy my new landscape watercolor course. It's called Watercolor Landscape Workshop. There's a 50% off coupon code in the video description if you're interested. And if you have any questions about that new watercolor class, you can ask that in the chat as well. Just make sure to put question in all caps and please be patient and kind because um, Maisie's only moderated one other one of my live streams before. So it might take us a few minutes to get into the groove. The first thing that we are going to do is we are going to wet the back of the paper. This is one of these uh, techniques where we do the wet back of the paper. It's really great for the summer because everything dries so quickly that um, if you can start off with the back of your paper wet, it's going to give you a lot more working time. I'm working on Strathmore Ready Cut Watercolor Paper, which is 100% cotton, but this technique also worked good on the Cotton Pulp Arteza Watercolor Paper. Not their premium. I'm not crazy about that one. It's all right. But their expert one that is the the cheaper one so um this technique will work on any cotton paper and most of your wood pulp papers as well and it gives you that lovely extra open time and then you want to go ahead and wet the front as well and give it a second to soak in do we have any questions so far maze um we got one about the ref where you got the reference photo but you can answer that Yep, Pexels, so, and I, li I linked that up in my blog post, and the blog post is linked up in the video description, and you'll have all your information right there in one handy spot. You want to make sure you wet the entire paper. Uh, if you're working on a wood pulp paper, you just want to watch out for puddles. They can be a little prone to um, like uh, cauliflower and blossoming effects because the, the surface of the paper often dries unevenly. And I'm just tipping it to the light to see if I have any dry spots. By wetting the back of the paper, you don't need to tape it down because you even out the tension of the water. And it just keeps it nice and flat. I mean, look how flat this is. I never, um, I didn't tape it down. I just wet the back and the front, and it worked out really well. The first colors we're going to use here, and I'm going to give you a couple options because I do have some weird colors in this palette. It's a kind of a hod podge palette. I have... Um, some of the, I, I had like 12 of the Schmincke academic colors, and I think I have like 10 of those still in here, and then I had 12 Schmincke Horadam watercolors, and I think I have all 12 in here. So it's, it's and it's a weird assortment that they had sent me, so um, I'll be just kind of mixing and matching. I am using this uh, Helio Turquoise, which looks like a Cobalt Turquoise, not the Cobalt Teal that's really, really bright, but the more duller Cobalt Turquoise. And I have two buckets of water, one to clean my brush and one to get fresh water from. I'm taking some of that turquoise and I'm going to add a little bit of uh, phthalo blue. Actually, that's ultramarine, not phthalo. We have a question. Yes. Do you still recommend the water media by Matt by Waffle Flower? Uh, that's what I'm working on, actually. Well, you know, the thing is, I really like it. Um, it stains. And I soaked this puppy in bleach all day the other day because I had been using it um, in my watercolor workshop. And it was just so stained, like especially greens and blues. Um, I soaked it all day in bleach, and I could not get the stains completely out. So if that doesn't bother you, then yes, I recommend it. If having, like, tools that are a little bit stained bothers you, then I would say no, because you're going to be, you're going to be aggravated by that. Any complaints about the sound? Oh, no. And, like, they can't hear. Uh, is it crackly, or is it just too quiet? I heard some, like, that are muffled, low sound, um, no sound. Okay, let me, um... Let me take a look here. Some people are saying it's fine, but... Um, oh, some people say it's fine, and some people say it's not? Yeah. Hey, uh, Joe Maisky, you're in the chat. Can you let me know how it sounds from your end? If you could turn your speakers on if they're not on. And um, I can switch mics 
if mm -hmm. that's a problem. I'm going to keep on going for now. And um, maybe as soon as Joe remarks, please let me know. All right, so I've taken that mix, which is phthalo, and just use the phthalo blue, just really watered down if you don't have that turquoise. I think it makes an interesting texture and interesting color. Um, I'm going to add a little more color to that, and I'm just going to work it down my paper a little bit so it fades. For some reason, crackly. Oh, crackly. Okay, I'm going to unplug and plug in. Okay, um, if somebody could please let us know, it'll be 30 seconds delayed from, okay. from what I um, am doing. I'm hearing better, but that was not a question. Okay. Um, so when you wet the back, do you have to wet the entire front of the paper, or can you just do a little? You can just wet sections. You can wet the back, and then I could just wet the sky if that's all I wanted to work on. So now I'm taking some, um, let's see, you can use a carmine or quinacridone rose. You want a cool red. And I'm adding that at the mountain line here. Uh, Ooh, that's strong. Joe said it's a little quiet for me, and I'm all maxed up. Oh, okay. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check what um what microphone. Maybe I did. Oh, maybe I had a different mic selected, and I didn't realize it. Real tech. Oh yeah, the wrong mic. And I wonder if I can. Uh, okay, guys, this is going to blank out for a second. I'll be right back. Okay, so just stay where you are in the chat. Maisie, you can keep chatting with them. I'm, I'm going right. to stop my encoder for a second and then I got to switch it and I'll be right back. Okay, is the player going? Uh, it's like this. There we go. Okay. We should be back. Let me know if you're having problems. Oh, yes. I'm seeing much better levels on my mic. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Oh, Joe good. said much better. Oh, great. Wonderful. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, the, the beauty of live. Oh, how I've missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting a bunch of good results. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Okay, so I've done this little rose here at the bottom of the sky. Now I did add, I'm going to add a little yellow in there. Um, I'm going to do a little yellow ochre because um, there was a little bit of warmth in between the rose and the green. I don't want a lot, just a tiny little bit of yellow ochre. I'm blotting my brush. I don't want to have a lot of water on there because I don't want blossoms, but I just want a little bit of warmth in my sky there. And you got to be careful, keep it away from the blue. You just want to kind of overlap the pink a little bit and call it good. And I'm also saying that I missed a little spot on the edge. Now that probably be covered up with a mat. You don't have to mess with it, but say it was in the middle and obviously you wouldn't want a streak with a damper brush. When my brush is clean, I've wiped, I've blotted off all the extra water. I can go in and I can just nudge that paint to cover that little streak. I mean, it's barely noticeable, but I figured it'd be worth showing you how to do it. Ooh, and now I'm getting, oh, now I'm lifting it. So now I'm going to work it right back in. There we go. Just go right off the edge when you're doing this technique so that you don't end up with start and stop lines. So now what we're going to do, and I've got a little glare on my paper, I notice. Let me see if I can adjust my lights so that I can move that glare a bit. Sorry about the jiggling guys. Um, I guess we're just going to have some glare. So this should, this, I'm just going to tip this so you can see the color. Sorry about the glare. Um, I'm going to grab some of that yellow ochre. And I'm going to mix it in with that sky color. That's a little too green. So I'm going to grab just a little bit of the phthalo blue on its own. Okay. And I'm going to blot my brush off because I seem to have a lot of pigment in there. And my paper's wet enough, so I don't really have to worry about that so much. And now I am going to paint in this bit of mountain back here. So question, is yes. Arch's paper sized the same on both sides? Can I paint on the back side after I've removed it from the block? You should be able to. Arch's is double-sided. Um, the texture is usually a little bit different, usually a little rougher on the back side. But uh, yeah, it's sized internally and externally on both sides. So just want to watch out for... Um, for puddles, I'm gonna grab a paper towel here. I had a little paint go uncontrollably into the sky there, so I just want to.
soften that. So you get a little bit more working time when you do this because even though it looks like you have a hard edge, since the paper is wet on both sides, it's just hanging out there. It's waiting for you to move it around. But because it's wet on both sides, it's not flowing quite as much as it would otherwise. Otherwise, if you just had, if you had wet the front of the paper and the back of the painter, paper was dry, when you go in to add color, it wants to flow crazy where all the water is. But when you have both sides of the paper wet, you equal out the um, the tension and it just kind of stays where you put it. You'll, and you'll have soft edges, but they're not going to go flow uncontrollably on you. I just want to get a little bit of this mountain color in between some of these areas of the pagoda. So you would be able to see a little bit of mountain in there. And I'm just going to bring that down a little bit here because we have some like city happening over there. I just need to bring this mountain down like that. Now I think I'm going to switch to a smaller half inch brush so I can put a few smaller mountains or narrower mountains. And the, the uh, synthetic, these are all synthetic brushes, but this one is designed to mimic fur. So it holds a lot more water. This one is what's called the golden Taclon brush. It's a smoother bristles and there it's not very absorbent. So it's not going to hold as much water. I'm going to grab a little of the Thalo blue and mix it in with that uh, previous mix that we had. And I'm going to add just a, just a little mountain in here. I think. Ooh, that's a little strong, I think. And if you feel like your brush is too wet, just tap it on your paper towel. Did you have a question, Maze? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're just putting in these kind of like soft hills. They were asking about the how you got the paper to stick down without tape. But oh, yep, just wetting the back. Mm -hmm. I always feel a little bad when I throw away all that tape at the end. You know, even though I love seeing that white border, I always feel a little bad that, you know, all that tape is going in the trash. I'm sure it's not biodegradable. So we have a question. Yes. I know you can add honey or glycerin to paints that get to dry in a pan. Is there a trick to get a runny paint to dry so you can add them to a travel palette? Um, not that I know of. I would just stick with a, I would avoid um, Sennelier and M. Graham. Those are two that I, I love those paints, but I would avoid them for your travel palette if you're prone to having really humid areas because it will, if you go into the tropics or any place humid, it, they get really sticky. Um, honestly, a lot of times though, oh, you know what? It's a great travel palette. I think I have one right here. The Renaissance pans. Um, my friend April over at a little creative Etsy shop, she sells them. They're... Uh, pans. I really like the two paints too, but the two paints have honey. Their pans, I they say they do, but they are super, super dry, but they reactivate really, really quickly. I would recommend those for a travel plate uh, palette because they're not going to go running on you at all. And the colors, you can see they're very vibrant. They look a little chalky in the pans, but they're not. They're super vibrant um, and they're very affordable. I think the half pans are like $350. They might even be less. I don't know. They're not, they're not bad. The Yarka pans go really sticky too. So I would try those. And I'm sure there's other brands. If anybody else has had really good luck with paints in a travel palette. I also like core paints in the travel palette because that Aquazol binder doesn't seem to um, like melt out on you like other things. And it gets really humid in Maine. Um, and I haven't had any issues with my core paints. Grace said bye. Oh, bye Grace. I have a question. What kind of board are you painting on? This is a silicone mat. All right. I'm feeling like those, those, those are a little too bright, those hills back there. I'm going to add a little bit of burnt sienna. I'll just tone them down a little bit. They just feel way too bright. And then I think I might actually even blot them a little bit to, to lighten them. Those are way, looks like there's a, I'm off my, I'm off my live stream game. I'm blotting those up. They're way too dark. So if this happens to you, just go right over it with pure water. You're going to dissolve that paint. You've got all the time in the world because your paper is wet on both sides. The only thing you might, you know, just be concerned with is if your paper is not very well sized or or not very high quality, you could start to see pilling. So you just want to be careful not to overwork your paper. 
I have no idea how much this, a Strathmore Ready Cut can take. It is cotton, so I'm hoping it can do pretty well. I'm actually going to pull that color right down into where the city is so I don't end up with any hard, unusual lines to deal with later. Man, I practiced this. Sometimes I like the practice goes so smoothly that you're like, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. And then, you know, you completely forget how to paint after a day at the beach. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, there we go. So that's smooth. We're going to put some, you know, I think I'm going to do a different technique this time for the hills. I think I'm going to take that flat brush I was just using. And I'm going to load that up one corner only. I'm going to do side loading. Load that up in my, uh, in my color. And I think I'll do my hills that way because they're really not very well pronounced. So I don't want them to be as dark as I had them. How do you select colors for painting? Um, well, I'm, I use the reference photo for this one pretty accurately, but then I'll also like, if I think that another color is going to work better somewhere because it's going to make the picture pop, I'll do that. I'm going to grab a little ultramarine blue, pretty pasty, because I've got all that. I've got some phthalo blue underneath, um, and it's pretty wet, so I'm just adding, taking some ultramarine blue. It's pretty pasty, and I'm going to just kind of chop in a few building shapes, just rectangles, basically. Then I'm going to take a little viridian hue. I didn't clean my brush. That will help me. Bless you. That will help me cross pollinate the colors. How many people do we have watching? Uh, 281. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Let's see if we hit 300. Oh, that would be cool. Tell your friends, everybody. Now that we've got our microphone, <laughs> I'm sure that'll be the last thing that happens today. We repainted our mountains and we've got a microphone mishap, but other than that, I think we're, That's right. I think we're uh, golden. We set up so early too, because I was like, geez, I haven't done this in a while. I better make sure I, I'm early in case I have any technical issues. <laughs> Question. Yes. So it's from Katie. Can you recommend any artist grade for watercolor that are responsibly priced? Oh yeah. Um, I really I think the Turner paints are really well priced. Um, da Vinci is really well priced. Um, on Amazon, sets are usually pretty well priced. I think they have a Winsor and Newton set of twenty four half pans that. Um, are under a hundred dollars at least it, they used to be i got mine for like 88 there a while back but they do they do change their prices fairly frequently um it also depends on the size of the set that you want a sennelier has a lovely little test pack of five tubes all the big stores like jerry jadarama have them and i think it's like 12 bucks so that's a great way to get some colors for not a lot of money the core introductory sets are pretty inexpensive you know i think it just boils down to what's your budget and how much do you want to spend the Yarka White Knights? Those two brands are usually pretty affordable. There, there are many options. Schminka is really cheap. If you're in Europe, you can get it. Jackson's has a pretty good price on that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move over to our little pagoda here. Oh, we got some gunshots outside. <laughs> Maybe fireworks. Oh, probably fireworks. Yeah, that makes sense. Although it's still not, it's not completely dark yet. <laughs> that makes more sense. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with a warm red. So you want something like a scarlet or a Chinese red, something that is just really bright and, uh, and red. A vermilion would work. Not too orange. You want it kind of neutral to slightly warm. And I am going to add the red areas to my pagoda. And yes, the paper is wet, but um, it's not gonna it's not gonna go crazy on me. It will feather a little bit, but um, we can sharpen things up when when it's dry. We will sh like speed it along a little bit with our heat tool at the end. But um, you want to try to get as much done in this uh, layer as you can. It just gives you a much fresher look. 
by Maisie. I'm talking in the chat today. Oh, somebody asked who was... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to ask, uh, say the questions out, too, if you're going to answer them, just because otherwise people will be like, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Also, your warm colors tend to be a little bit more opaque, so they layer up really well. And also, they tend to be a little bit more sedimentary, so they don't tend to travel as much as your cool, tra really transparent colors. Like if I had Quinn Rose here, that's a much more um, fluid color, so it would want to it would want to bleed a lot and feather a lot more, and maybe even travel a lot more than this color does. That's another reason it's nice to use that helio, um, I don't know if it's helio turquoise or helio cerulean, the schminka, what they call it, um, but because it's a mineral based pigment, I believe it's a cobalt based pigment, it doesn't want to run, it wants to stay because it's heavier, it's not going to move as much. Joy said, could you please show us how to paint a rainbow, those of the building trees? Paint a rainbow? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to put a rainbow in this painting, but I can add it to my request list. Mm -hmm. For another time. Yeah. I like to go in um, with a color at its brightest first, and then I, can, then I can mix on the paper and dull it down afterwards. And I know I'm gonna, a lot of this uh, stuff in here is going to end up being kind of shadowed, but I do want to get something here because I don't want to just have a big gaping hole with nothing. I want it to have a little bit rough of an edge because I know I'm gonna have bushes and stuff, so I am just tapping my brush. And I got that little bleed there, but I think I'm gonna leave it because I think that might be nice to add into some foliage, so I'm not gonna fuss about that. So now for the shadows on this building, oh, I need a little bit more red in there. For the shadows on this building, I'm just going to grab some of the phthalo blue. The blues are so dark it's hard to tell them apart in the palette, so I'm going to grab phthalo blue. I'm going to add some of that red to it. Now, because um, phthalo blue leans towards green and this red leads towards orange, they're almost opposite on the color wheel, so they will make a really dark, a dark purpley color. Um, do you know where this reference photo was taken? Uh, I don't know exactly. I know it's a, um, it's a temple in Japan, I believe. But um, it's linked on my blog, so you can go and you can contact the photographer. It is a commercial use photo that is free to use for these types of things. So I'm just dabbing some of that color in there and just letting it flow. Mary asks, can you talk about paper types and the best value for the money? The best value for the money, I would say probably the best value for the money, and again, it totally depends on where you are and what you have access to. Um, if you're in Europe, I would say Hanamule is probably the best value, just going by what people have said they've been able to, to find it for. Um, in the United States, I would say that the B paper company, you can get um, Aqua B paper, like this is Aqua B, it's a six inch by nine inch side, size, 100% cotton, and it's, it was, I just checked the other day, it was $13 yesterday for 50 sheets on Amazon. And you can also get 22 by 30 inch full sheets for like 280 a sheet or so on Amazon. And I bought some on NASCO once because I wanted a 25 sheet pack and I think I paid around $2 a sheet. So definitely, um, that's probably definitely the best bang for your buck. What brush are you using? This is a number six round espresso by Royal and Langnickel. It's a uh, faux sable. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna do the roof. I'm gonna just let those colors just kind of sit and do their thing. I am going to grab that um, Helio, it's either called Helio Cerulean or Helio Turquoise. It is a fairly, um, I don't wanna say muddy, but it's, it is definitely a little bit on the opaque side. Um, it's a little bit, or it's on, maybe I should say on the granulating side. It's not really opaque, but it's definitely not 
you know, really flowy, clean color. I'm adding that here on the highlight side of the roof. I am leaving a little gap in some places if I'm worried that the color running like that. Red ran so much, I'm leaving a little gap there for the, for the, just to make sure it doesn't like spill out. Not that it'd be a huge deal because it's spilling out into mountains that are kind of that color. I'm going to add a little bit of that onto this side. We hit 300, 312. Nice. And also, what sketchbooks would you recommend? Uh, oh, if you like watercolor, there's a couple. I like the Stillman and Burn Beta Series Mixed Media Sketchbook. Um, it's, I think, about 90 pound paper. It's, it's fairly smooth for watercolor, but it takes watercolor really well. And also pen, if you like to do pen and ink. I really like that. I like the new Arteza fabric covered sketchbooks. The paper is very similar. I think their paper is a little bit more warm where the Stillman and Burn is bright white and the Arteza is a little bit like, um, it's a little bit more um, cream. So those two are probably my favorite as far as like watercolor sketchbooks. So now I'm going to the Thalo blue and I'm going to add some Viridian hue to it. Um, what is the first layer of red called? called? Uh, that one is, uh, I believe it's cadmium red hue. I'm getting a lot of interesting shadows as these reds and greens mix together. If you're getting too much mixing, what you can do is just go in there and gently lift out the colors that are mixing. I hope it makes you, does it look clear? Are you letting the video play? Yes. Does it look clear on your mm. end or is it yeah, a little fuzzy? It, look, it, it looks a little bit fuzzy. It looks a little fuzzy here. I know, I mean, I know I do have colors that are kind of soft because of the, I'm just blotting a little bit up. I feel like I have a little too much on there. And I'm going to go in with this color on this roof here. That's the same color I just used. because there's a lot of reflection on this roof. It's a lot lighter. And I'm just gonna get a little slice of it here. See if I can leave maybe a little bit of a gap. I might have to go in and do some of this when it's dry. And then I'm gonna go in with the shadow and fill in underneath. And if you wanna save doing that roof until after everything's dry, that's fine. I don't blame you because it's getting that color wants to flow a lot, probably because of the thalo blue in it. But I like also just suggesting what's there versus having everything. I like that granulation that's happening there too. And it's kind of pretty. Okay, now while I have this dark color, I'm just gonna bring that over there a little bit. Let some of that shadow float into that building and back. Why do you, why do some colors not mix? I'm using the White Knight 12 pan set, tried to mix with purple and I got mud. Probably because you have a warm red or you have a cool blue. So you'd probably want to mix, um, a cool, you definitely want a cool red. If you have a warm red, you're going to get mud trying to make purple. So you'd want a red that, like if you look at my swatch here, you'd want a red, see how this red looks more like pink and this red looks more like orange and that red looks way more like orange. You'd want to be mixing your purple with one that looks already starting to look a little bit like purple, a pinker one. And then for blue, you'd want a blue that's already kind of leaning towards purple to be able to get a nice crisp, um, a nice crisp purple color. I'm not sure it's in the 12 color White Knight set, but I think they're pretty good about having a split primary color. Just make sure you have your cooler red and you should get a pretty good purple. I'm painting the shadows in this little fence here, this little railing, and I am going to go in and paint the shadows between the stones. So I'm doing kind of a negative painting effect here because I'm going to glaze over it after it's dry, after we've got the first layer on this painting. I'm going to switch to that little flat brush too because then I can do this without being very fussy. This is a brush I use for gouache a lot, so it gets a little beat up, so it might uh, 
It wants to split and splay a little bit, but that works all right for things like stones. So I'm going to fill in this whole area with this kind of patterny texture. Did you have a question? It oh. got deleted. Oh. <laughs> Must have been an off-topic question. <laughs> so I'm just basically kind of twisting and tapping my brush here to give this stony, uh, rocky texture. I'm, I'm just basically kind of trying to slap in the shadows, and then I'll brush over some highlights later. And I think I want a little room for some foliage down here, so I'm not going to fill in this whole corner. Since I have used some ultramarine blue, I'm going to grab a little ultramarine blue for this gray. That, that actually went quite purple for having a warm red. Grab some of that burnt sienna in there. Any color you've already used is a fair game for you to add to your mixes. I just try to avoid um, just grabbing random colors. Like I wouldn't grab a gray. If I wanted to paint gray, I would take the colors that I have and mix from that. And then I'll take my round brush and just do a couple detailed, more detailed stones. And then I will move on to some foliage. This is kind of an intuitive, almost abstract like painting, but you're going to end up with a picture that does look like uh, like something when you're done. That does look like a represented representational thing. Don't want to. Um, don't. I don't mean to say anything about negative about abstract painting. That is a totally valid, awesome art form. Question: uh, Is there a way to coat your paper so you can lift out highlights easier? Yep. There's. It's called lifting preparation, and it's me. I know that. Uh, that Windsor and Newton makes it, and probably others as well. Okay, so now we're gonna use a sponge, and you can use a, um, a sea sponge, you can use a cut up kitchen sponge. It's nice to have a, a couple different shapes or varieties to use. You wanna dip them in your water and wring them out really well to get them ready for your paint. This one I know is dirty, so I'm dipping it in the dirty water first, getting the excess, any leftover pigment out of there. Okay, and then we can use any of the foliage colors that we want to put in here. Um, you can use golds, you can use um, greens, whatever you want. I want to use some yellows over here. And don't forget the white of the paper can be a color as well. You can like leave that. And you can be light or heavy with this application. It's completely up to you. And I like to pick it right up from the pan because our sponge is already wet. Um, it won't leave a lot of residue behind, which is really nice. And then you get that nice concentrated color and you get the texture. Because if, if your paint's too wet, you're not going to get the texture. You have any more questions about what, what was the original red that you used? Um, this one right here, I believe it's Cad Red Deep. But any warm, intense red. And it might be a hue. I don't know if Schminke uses cadmium. Some company I was surprised to learn recently doesn't use cadmium. What are some of your favorite colors from specific brands and why? Hmm. Well, I like I like a lot of the really bright colors from Core, um, which is the watercolor company by Golden. I like their cobalt teal a lot. Um, uh, they all of their high chroma colors are really really nice. Um, I love Sennelier's French Ultramarine, I love Daniel Smith's uh, French Ultramarine. I like um, uh, Schmincke's Cobalt Blue Deep, that's a really beautifully granulating color. Put a little bit of blue in this. Get some oranges going. That's so hard, there's so many colors. 
I love the reds in the Yarka line. I love the cool reds in Yarka. They have some really pretty ones. White Knights in Yarka are the same. Same company. They just offer, um, they offer, they have a different name for different countries. It's, it's the same paint. It's just different trade names. That's, a, that's one of the best values going in watercolor. I like Pyrrhal Scarlet in Daniel Smith, but I also like that color in uh, Turner. That's pretty good. It's just a great pigment. It seems to be very reliable and very strong. Yellows are great for breaking out of, um, breaking over another color because even though you think of yellow being kind of weak a lot of times, it actually is a little more opaque than other colors because it's a warm color and your warmer colors tend to be a little bit more opaque. We'll go to this guy here. And I think I want some more green. I think I'll get some of that Viridian going here. See if I can fit that sponge in here. This color is real strong, so I will have to probably temper it down with some other colors on top. And then I somehow got into some light paint with a sponge, so I'm going to wring that out before it muddies up my mix. We're about halfway done our painting. Well, probably more than that, actually. I honestly, I like the kitchens, the cheap old kitchen sponges the best for this technique. I feel like they do. Um, they're easier to smush into a pan and they just give such a variety of texture for one thing you get so much so much variety you can load up a couple colors on your sponge because um, a sponge doesn't tend to uh, muddy up your pans too much you any other questions nope. look at this kind of abstractly and um, you know, just try not to think that you're painting foliage. Try to think what color would look good here, what color would look good there, and look at it uh, more of like a design um, challenge than an actual painting challenge, or then you're actually trying to paint something in specific, something that's specific, because uh, it will work out better if you're just trying to make an interesting pattern. A question from the archive What colors typically grit? granulate or does it depend on brand? Generally colors that are made from minerals will granulate. Uh, earth tones granulate. Uh, colors that come from like rust which is like iron oxide those tend to granulate. Mineral based colors like the Daniel Smith Primatech line that granulates really really well. Um, another question from Mike. Is the paper still wet in the area where Lindsay is painting the foliage? Yes it is. Still wet. Everything's still wet. I want to put a couple more deliberate trees in here. And to do that, I am going to get a little bit more of an expressive brush. I got my number eight round Mimic. So somebody had asked earlier what my favorite brushes are. I think all around my the, the Mimic um, squirrel brushes, they're not real squirrel. They're a faux squirrel and they're sold by Jerry's Artorama and they're also available on Amazon. They're, they're sold by Jerry's Artorama either place. The brand is Creative Mark which I think, I don't know if they're owned by Jerry's or if they're just um, distributed by them, but I think for the price and for the quality, you can't beat them. Okay, I'm gonna grab a little bit of this red. I'm gonna make myself a really, really inky dark. So I red and green, so I got the Viridian and I've got that Cad Red Deep. What a warm, intense red. It doesn't have to be cadmium. It can be scarlet. It can be vermilion. So we have another question from Katie. Sure. If you could buy unlimited amount of artist watercolor, what colors would you suggest for starting? Ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, those two, uh, burnt sienna, those colors are the ones that I have to refill on my on my palette. Um, can't say for everybody, but those are the ones that I, want, that I need to refill on my palette more frequently than others. Um... They are also fairly inexpensive colors, which is nice. They're usually series one. Paints go by a size of um, usually one to five, and the higher the series number, the more expensive they are because the um, the pigments are more pricey. They're rarer or they're just more, more expensive. 
I'm mimicking the shape of the pagoda with the tree that I'm doing over here. So that's why I'm making these bristles kind of like these branches kind of like tip up kind of like the peaks of the pagoda because it enforces that shape. It repeats it. That tree isn't in the reference photo, but um, I think that gives us a nice balancing effect. Okay, so you have a question. Yeah. Um, my pagoda has turned into a hot mess of red and blue paints all blending together. What should I do? You just let it do its thing. Go with the flow. When we dry it, then you'll be able to go back in and sharpen things up. We're going to use a little white gouache, or you can use a white paint pen, and we will be able to add some crisp lines, and it will be all you need to bring it into focus. I know it seems a little crazy right now, but trust me, just a, a well-placed white line is going to make all the difference. And I love because you can keep it really expressive. Now you could pre-plan, but I think with something like this where you're wetting the back of the paper and you're letting the paints do their thing, pre-planning is really difficult um, and it can kind of uh, take a lot of the spontaneity away. This is a very spontaneous landscape, even though I practice it. It doesn't really look all that much like the first one I did. So, you know, just kind of don't, don't, uh, don't fret. It's going to be all right. Now, if you want, you could scrape in some lines in that tree, but um, I don't think I want the visual. I don't think I want the actual physical texture on this. I think I want everything to be kind of visual. There's something else I want to do is drip in some color here. I think that this would look fantastic to have some Viridian just kind of dripped in there. So I'm making myself up some nice juicy inky Viridian. I'm just going to drop it in. I'm going to grab some of my Thalo Blue. The Thalo Blue is definitely has more of like a... Uh, a cyan tint to it so it's a little bit almost a little bit greener um, uh, and, not, and a regular phthalo blue I think would have probably actually even work a little bit better or Prussian blue whatever your whatever you have on hand whatever your preference is and then I'm actually going to take some of the sky color because I didn't get that uh, that cooler red really anywhere else so I want to get that in someplace else so I'm gonna go ahead and grab that clean my brush off with clean water so this would be your Quin Rose your Carmine your permanent rose your Alizarin Crimson whatever you prefer for a cool red that's gonna go into this guy here looks like you're getting a lot of new live viewers oh sweet what are we up to we're up three and nine but I don't people are commenting like oh it's my first time so oh nice that's good. Yeah, what do you guys think of this time? Like the, the Friday night. Yeah, it's oh, definitely that's... different. <laughs> uh, there, so that kind of, and that also having a little red, even though it's a sky red, it still also mimics the pagoda a little bit more. So you're kind of reinforcing that theme. I'm going to grab a little bit of the gold from the sky. Remember we used yellow ochre. I'm going to add a little bit of that into the tree. Even though we know there's that color isn't really in the tree. It can be just the sunlight just kind of hitting the edges. And it's fun to see what your colors will do. If you feel like you're too saturated in color, you can go remove some. I'm going to take that leftover on my brush and I'm going to go dab some here and there. And A bunch of people like this time. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah it's... It, it, uh, I always felt super rushed at 1230 in the afternoon, which, which is weird. It's like, why should I feel so rushed that early? I mean, that's late, but I felt like I had all the time in the world. Um, mm. Drag some of that color out. Question from Art Adventure. Can the light source be adjusted? The glare for the tree prevents... Oh, the shoot. Media. Yes, that is crazy. Let me see what, what is glaring on that exactly. I think it's this one. Let me, uh, I think it's, now it's glaring on something else. I'm gonna blot a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna blot that a little bit anyway. That yellow ochre, cause it's opaque. Yellow ochre tends to be more opaque. It's really taken over that tree. Mm -hmm. I can feel the back of the paper is starting to get, uh, it's starting to dry a little bit. Now, if you're painting, over a longer period of time and you wanted that um, you wanted that paper wetter longer you can like take a big flat brush and you can gently lift it up and wet that back of the paper so you can keep that going longer so we have a question from homeschool for two 
Uh, do you find it necessary to use an actual brush cleaner on your watercolor brushes every now and then to keep them in good condition, or is rinsing them out with water good enough? Usually rinsing them with water is good enough, and honestly, a little uh, dish soap will usually do the trick. Now, if a brush gets used for the wrong medium, like say your expensive watercolor brushes, and I'm not naming names or anything, but say your expensive watercolor brushes get used with acrylic paints, then <laughs> uh, you'll want to do a brush cleaner after that so it's worth having a tube of that around so that you can uh, you can oh Maisie will you go grab some salt out of the kitchen because I want to put some salt sure. in that tree I think that would be Maisie's offline for a minute she's gonna <laughs> grab me some salt because I think that's exactly what that needs um so yeah I just I added a little more green to that that was kind of uh that yellow ochre man that was that kind of took over now I feel like I want a little more red in there though because I lost that and red's my favorite color so I'm gonna do a little bit. Gotta be careful I could feel some beads of water on that. There we go. Sometimes it can be tricky to tell exactly how much you need. Now I'm gonna take some of that color. I like to add my colors elsewhere. I like to pull up little little bushes and scruffiness at the edges of things. Like especially we have the texture of the city and the mountains, those are smoother and blockier and you get this organic texture. Now that little splooch there that I said we would turn into some foliage, we can do that right now too. Here's the salt. Thank you. I'm gonna see what happens. Let's put a that salt right in there. Hopefully it hopefully it hasn't soaked into the paper and I can get some cool cool texture in there. Even though I didn't want the scrapey texture, I was thinking that that might be a nice texture. To have in there. It's intuitive. Going with the flow. Okay, so um, Joy asked, some say we can spray with Krylon UV protection for watercolor. What is your opinion? Um, well, honestly, I probably wouldn't spray a painting unless it's not going to be under glass. Uh, I think glass or plexiglass, actually plexiglass is even better as far as UV protection. Um, Anytime you spray on paper, even with fixative, even being acid free, I still think anytime you're spraying a chemical like that, that's got solvents in it on your painting, you're going to run the risk of it turning brittle eventually. And it may not happen for a long time. I mean, I would, if, if you want to frame it without, without glass and that's why you want to spray it, or maybe you know you used watercolors that are not, they're going to fade, or you're using inks or something, you just know it's going to fade. Um, and you know it's not going to be around very long in any event, then yeah, sure, give it, give it a spray. It's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to make it die quicker. But I think if you're using decent quality watercolors, um, I think spraying it could do more harm than good. Now, if you are going to spray it, you know, you could use an artist grade spray and that should, you know, that will, shouldn't be harmful. But I don't know, anything with adhesives or solvents on paper, I'm leery of. I mean, if you use oil paint on paper, it will rot it. You have to prime it, you have to protect it. And if you've just got watercolor and this watercolor binder on your paper, it's not going to have the protection that that like a like oil paint or acrylic paint gesso would, would give something. So I don't, you know, you can do whatever you want to do and obviously follow what the, what the, um, what the manufacturers say, but just my gut says it's not a good idea to spray. Could you put a wet paper towel underneath the back of the paper to keep it wet longer? Um, you probably could. I don't think it would stick so flat though. I think you'd end up with some warping issues. So some TLC time asks, will Friday nights be live from now on? Um, I'm not going to commit to anything in the summer. <laughs> Um, because, you know, my, my kids are in high school, they're, um, going to be 15 and 17 and, you know, if we get a chance to take off, I don't want to be tied down to any specific programming, but when the school year starts up, I would be open to doing, um, to doing something on a, on a weekly basis again. Mm -hmm. I needed a little break the last few months. Oh gosh, that glare is awful. I'm gonna, excuse me guys, I'm just gonna stand up and see if I can move this light a little bit and get that glare. Yeah, it's uh, a busy life. It's hard to find a time that you can commit. 
Yeah, that might be a little bit better for now. I might have to move it back, but you can kind of see the texture of the salt just sitting in there. I don't know if it's going to resist anything, if it's going to push the pigment around like it usually does, but I'm trying to let it be for a few minutes to see what I can make happen there. Let's see what we've used this yellow here. So let's grab that one again. I like to get some nice rich colors in here because I know I want to put some white in because I really like the effect of doing the white on my on my sketch here. Um, so I, I want to make sure I have rich colors in there so my white will show up. And this is this one right here. Do we have another question or? I feel like this foliage is taking me longer than anything ever to paint. Oh wow, that's just so dry. What's that? The glare is gone. Well, it was when you. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you're you're looking at your picture. Oh, because you're thirty seconds. You got the thirty second delay happening. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad we got that mic problem figured out. I'm gonna have to put a note on the video saying, "Just hang in there. Give me a couple minutes." All right, so now I want to put a like a kind of flood a little wash of gray in here and man things are drying up I think I can I think I can do that right there without that being a problem and I'm gonna check the sky The sky feels pretty dry too, so I can do the little detail on the uh, sky there. Everything's nice and flat All right, so for a gray. I really like that red and green mix I had going on So someone asked if you could go over your new classes um Oh yes, my new class, Watercolor Landscape Workshop. It is, um, it's all watercolor landscapes. So if you've ever wanted to get a little more proficient at doing skies and trees and rocks, rocks are my favorite. Um, this class will walk you through, I think it's like six different deciduous trees. There's a couple different ways to do conifers. Um, we do um, different, uh, uh, three different ways to do rocks. So if you're freaked out about the thought of doing rocks because you know you're kind of psyching yourself out out about it um there's three different ways to do it so that you're not really thinking about painting rocks you're just kind of doing your own thing or you're, you're following these steps that kind of look very abstract and then you all of a sudden have rocks um so we break down some basic elements like that and then we do four real-time long tutorials long paintings together step by step and that um, kind of enhances what we've already learned. And then there's certain things that you can't really teach out of context, at least I don't think, like, um, oh, like for instance, mountains and water. You kind of need other aspects for your, like if you're gonna do water, well, you need to know what is around the water, what's in the sky, what's going on, you know, what's gonna be reflected in the water. So doing water on its own without context is a little bit, is a little less helpful, so um, so I try to do those elements in the real time tutorials so that you get um, so that you get a full or well rounded batch of options by the time you've done the course. Oh, it's hard to paint one thing and talk about something else. <laughs> um, Nikki asked, no CC scraper tonight. No credit card scraper tonight. No, not on this one. I know, shocking, isn't it? All right, so I'm going to grab a little more of that red, mix it in with that green, add a little bit of, let's see, let's add a little bit of ultramarine blue to that. Make a nice dark, and this is going to go in the top, this little kind of like steeply area. Um, I'm holding my brush straight up and down, so hopefully my hand's going to be in the way. I don't think there's any way around that. I'm going to do my best to kind of keep my hand out of the way. But I'm going to draw a straight line up from the top of the pagoda. Um, so what qualities in the water media, Matt, do you find the most valuable? Um, just the, the waterproofness of it. And I like that it's got little wells. So if I'm working with gouache and I want to work fresh from the tube, I can just squirt it into the little mixing wells. I have my, um, my palette sitting on top of them. It's pricey though. It's 36 bucks which um, it's a little pricey. I think it's gonna last you plenty of, um, you know, plenty of years, as long as you don't cut on it, because it's not a cutting surface. I think it's, you know, I think it's well-made and gonna last you quite a while. It's got little markings on it, so if you like to do YouTube videos or post your work on Instagram, it's got like little markings for keeping things like in a square frame, but you probably wouldn't want a stained mat on your Instagram photos if you're using it for that and it does stain. So that's, I mean, that's really the only drawback is the staining issue for me. It's just so, um, 
it just it just stains and I'm not gonna bother bleaching it again I thought I would give it a try just to see if it brought it back to white um, I tried using toothpaste on it and that worked a bit but it definitely was not um, was not foolproof ink seems to be the worst like ink pads uh, but watercolor especially your like phthalo colors those stain really bad um, so I mean if you don't mind the staining I think it's wonderful you can use hot glue on it it's not going to um, it's not going to be damaged your you could protect your work surface protect your table uh, keeps your table dry so if like you're working like I'm working on a wooden table a wooden desk it's keeping that the water from damaging the wood What's the size of a mat? Uh, the place where you can put your painting is 9 by 12. The whole thing is probably, I would say like 11 by 16 or 12 by 16 maybe. This is an 8 by 10 painting. So that can give you a little bit of scale. All right, I'm going to go in. Boy, my the pagoda is still a little wet, but I think that's fine. I'm going in with that green, red, with a little bit of blue mix and adding some shadows. I'm just adding some kind of random shapes here to suggest architecture. And I think I want to dry this before I do anything else. So if you've got questions while I'm running the dryer is an excellent time to ask them. I'm not sure if our salt is really doing much over there, but we'll, we'll dry it and see if that helps it a little bit more. So what do we got for people watching now? All right, we have a question oh, yeah, from okay. Tamara. Have you tried the Pentelic Aqua Journal? I have not. I've heard good things about their, that brand of sketchbooks, but I've never used them. If anybody has and wants to chime in in the chat, then uh, then please feel free. Uh, my paper's starting to curl a little bit because I'm drying the front side, but the back side is still damp. But when I lift it up after I've got this kind of really wet area dried and I lift it up, it will flatten back out again. It'll just uh, Once I dry the back so it's equal, the tension's equal again. Any more? Any more questions? Wanda has to leave. Oh, <laughs> bye, Wanda. Well, if it's 90 right now in Maine, or today in Maine, it must be a lot harder in the rest of the country. I bet everybody else has been hiding inside. Yes, I got so sunburned today. Oh. Good thing you wore sunscreen, or you'd be crispy. <laughs> All right, so now this is mostly dry. I'm gonna just kind of tip it and get the back so I can even it out and uh, flatten it out a little bit. A hair dryer would work just fine for this, but if you're using a hair dryer and your paint is really wet, be careful because it could blow the paint, uh, especially if you have any puddly paint. So you could end up with like um, with spatter where you don't want it or streaking where you don't want it. This uh, is a heat it tool by Ranger. It's uh, it makes heat but not wind, so it will dry things quickly without blowing things around. Now I have three questions. Okay. So first one's from Nikki. Does the heat tool change how the salt acts? Well, the best, you'll get the best results with salt if you can just leave it alone, um, and if you don't disturb it once you've added it, but I got a feeling that I had, with that yellow ochre, that it was a little too, um, the paint was a little too thick, and I'd already let it sit too long. Although I got a really neat texture, coming down in there. Um, yeah, the heat tool will take away some of the effect. It'll also take away some of the granulation if you're working in a granulated wash. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. I usually kind of just use it at the end stages just to make something dry enough so that when I go to paint over it, I'm not going to get feathering from the moisture in the paper. Okay. So how do you use a neutral tint paint like you did with the olive oil? Uh, what was the beginning of that? Have you used a neutral tint paint? I really haven't used it since that project. I mean, not not much. I did put it in my little mini um, etcher palette, which I'll be reviewing. Oh, I could show you that. That's pretty cute. Um, while I'm drying, I can multitask. This thing right here is adorable. It's a Stephanie Law palette. You probably might have seen it before. Well, I'll, I'm not going to take it all out, but look at that. Isn't that adorable? It's a little ceramic palette with like 37 wells. I put the neutral tint in there, so I've got high hopes that I'm going to return to that technique sometime. It was a lot of fun. It's a little time consuming. But um, but I really enjoyed the outcome of it, so 
just kind of, you know, it's, it's a certain, you know, it's a certain look you'd want for certain things, and I do tend to be a little bit more of a wild, freewheeling watercolorist, so I don't tend to do too much um, fussy, fussy sort of stuff. All right, so I got a really cool texture there, uh, and I like that. Uh, you can't brush the salt off yet. It's still a little wet there, but it's dry enough for me to go on to the what I want to do next. Um, all right, I did want a little more blue in the roof of the pagoda, that kind of tealy color. Oh, well, you know what? I'm just going to use my media mat here. Get the color I want. I like the phthalo because it's a little more transparent, but I like the hue of the of the turquoisey color. And I want a little bit more of that turquoisey color in this roof here. Now that I'm on dry paper, I can keep any lines that I want. They'll, they'll stay. And both sides of the paper are dry now. Now I also like this, I feel like I want to glaze over that with this turquoise color because there's such a, a like, um, almost this nostalgic coloring to the picture. And it, I mean, I think it's partly because it's there, but also partly because I printed this on like just regular old photo, uh, not photo paper, um, printer paper. So the colors are kind of a little muted on my reference photo that I'm going by that I printed. And I like that it looks kind of like an old, um, like an old, cheap old picture. Where did you get the tiny palette? Etcher. Um, if you go to etcher.com, it's available there. And, um, and they ship worldwide. So if you are interested, I will be doing a review on it next, a week from tomorrow. It's already filmed. I just have it scheduled to, to go up at that point. Um, it's really well made. It, the, you know, it, if you want a mini palette like that, I mean, I think that might be constrictive to some people, but... Um, you know, everybody paints differently. Everybody knows how they paint. If that's something that, you know, that would work for you. It's a, it's a dandy little thing. But E-T, um, etcherlab.com, E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B.com. Oh, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, get a little bit more of that blue. I, I just love to add little hints of color and just let it do its thing. I have a little yellow ochre in there. I love the way my rocks came out on this one. It's just so sketchy and so light and just, but it's it's so much more natural looking. I like that so much better than how I'm doing that this time. So keeping it real. Um, any tips on how you would like to arrange the colors in the round etcher palette? Um, you know what? Stephanie Law, the designer of the palette, actually did a video on it, and I wish I had watched it before I put my colors in because her way made really made a lot of sense. Um, I was just kind of going around the perimeter and I was kind of like keeping my colors like, I don't know, I started with my blues and then I got my yellows and then I was kind of going within the rings there. But you could do them like pie slices and have a pie slice of yellow, pie slice of blue, pie slice of green, you know, that sort of thing and go around the color wheel like that. Um, that's probably what I would recommend if I had to do it over again, but this is working out too. Uh, I have a sketchbook Sunday video on Sunday or a real time in critique club that will be using that palette. If you're curious, you can check those out. Okay. So what I really liked about my sketch was actually using some white gouache and I am going to use a little bit stiffer of a brush. Uh, I'm going to use regular synthetics. I've got a couple here. Oh, actually I'm going to use that espresso cause that one's pretty firm. And so I've got a number two uh, Da Vinci. I think it's a Nova. And I've got a number six round espresso. So two and a six, just make sure they're a little bit firm. And I'm going to use some white gouache, which I have right here on my palette already. And there's all these little, little trees that have these really, really bright white um, flowers on them. Kind of like dogwoods or cherry blossoms or apple blossoms, I guess. And I think that gives it such a um, authentic look to this area. So I want to get those in there. And what I love is like the the tinting on my photo. On a lot of these white blossoms, you see that teal. So I might add some of that teal in there too. 
Are you uploading this video for a tutorial? This will be um, available for replay as soon as the live broadcast is done. So it'll be right here at the same YouTube page. So you can come back, you can, yeah, you can watch it again as soon as it's done, or you'll be able to find it if you go to my channel. Yeah, I, I keep my live streams, unless something goes terribly wrong, um, I keep my live streams up. Has that ever happened? Well, I have had a couple that, like, for whatever reason, and I did leave them up just because, you know, I still think they were useful for, especially if people watched it live and it looked looked fine. I had some that processed weird, and then the, the quality wasn't very good um, when it was the video. That's another thing that's a bummer about live streams that if you know you you work really hard to plan it and then something goes wrong technically and then you can't recover your file um so that's happened before and i've just let it left them up so people can you know if they were watching live they they know what was going on and then they can kind of catch up because i don't want to like leave somebody high and dry if they were in the middle of a project it's a bummer but yeah that's happened i don't think i've ever pulled one down unless like the quality was just horrible or the audio was just horrible and then I probably just if the if the video was all right but the audio was bad I would probably just time lapse it and voice it over or something. Luckily we figured out the audio. Yeah, that's that's what's great about having somebody in the studio to moderate because then they can tell you that something is is nobody can hear you or whatever cuz otherwise you could you could do a full hour live stream and not know. That would be horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people do, and many of our moderators do live streams, and they're, um, you know, they watch the chat themselves, and I find that so distracting. I thought I might actually try to pull it up on my screen while I was going. I'm like, yeah, I can't. I can't. I can barely talk and paint at the same time. I definitely can't keep up with that. How do you know you've moved on to professional artist level in watercolor? Um, when you're not afraid of wasting the paint anymore. As long as you're, as long as that paint's really precious and you're too afraid to waste it, then stick with the, stick with the, um, with the student grade. But once you feel like you're not wasting it anymore, then you, then you're totally fine to go to the artist grade, art professional grade if you want to. Art paint wants to be used. It doesn't want to be sitting in its tube, sitting in a tube in your studio for the rest of its life. If you think you're gonna be afraid to use it, then then don't buy it, buy the cheap stuff. Get that under your belt. Once you, and once you feel like, once you want, you know, if you start wondering that, you know, would my skill be really be improved by this better paint? You know, when you're starting to have wondering like that, then you're probably ready. Cause then you try that and then you're gonna be, you're really gonna notice how good you've gotten once you start using the better paint. I wanna have a little bit of an orangey bush in here. I'm going to grab that um, warm red, mix it in with that yellow that's got a little bit of white gouache in it. You know, and some people start right off with the professional stuff and there's nothing wrong with that. I know, um, you know, you might say, you probably save money in the long run because you're just going to buy what you want to begin with. But I also know many more people who just, it feels too precious and they're afraid to waste it and so they never use it and that's worse to spend all that money on something you know and not use it that's a real waste wasting like coming up with some bummer paintings that's not a waste you used it you learned something it what a waste is it sitting in its tube on your shelf and drying out and never getting used um so someone asked my ultramarine buildings look terrible any suggestions ultramarine buildings um i would say maybe add a add a few like layers if they're if they're not too dark add a few layers of viridian buildings and i think that'll help kind of push them back a little bit or you could brush them with water and blot them and lighten them up that way chances are when you look at it tomorrow you're gonna like it um i think when you're working in the style and everything's a little crazy um looking it can be a little tough to judge you come back and look at it later, you see it better. Like I saw, I didn't realize how crooked my, my first pagoda was. It like, it's kind of lopsided, this little section here sticking all too far and tipping up. Um, so I didn't, couldn't evaluate that till I looked at it a couple hours later. But, um, but oftentimes your picture looks a lot better when you look at it a couple hours later. So, so yeah, you don't have to rush into altering something if you're not 
sure about it. I don't want to get rid of all that like juicy goodness in the middle. I like how that's kind of blended, so I'm just kind of adding a little bit of... Um, what's the red you just mentioned? The red I just mentioned? Yeah, someone had to turn off their volume. The vi it's very vibrant. Right there? Oh, I used some Cad Red Deep. That one right there? Is that what they're talking about? Or the Probably. red that... Yeah, Probably. that's all uh, Cad Red Deep. Pyrrole Scarlet is also vibrant like that. It's a, just a warm, bright red. Sometimes it's hard to balance the smushy areas with the detailed areas. Now, let's see, I really love, oops, I just blotted and dropped some water in there. I really love this bloom in here. I think that's really pretty and I like this dark area and I want it to stand out a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some yellow and think of, that's a, like a Indian yellow. It's just a real warm yellow, whatever warm yellow you like. I'm going to take some yellow ochre as well, which is an earthy warm yellow. And I am going to just negatively paint around it a little bit so I can get the edge. I can, you know, enhance the edge of that tree. So a lot of this, and it will be different in yours because everyone's going to be a little different. You just kind of pick out those bits you really like. What is the easiest thing to paint when you're starting watercolors? Uh, I think whatever you're excited about is the easiest thing to paint when you're getting when you're starting in watercolors. Um, the nice thing about landscapes is that it's not like you're painting a person or an animal. You know, if you're painting a person or an animal and the eyes aren't exactly in the right spot, you really notice it. But if you're painting like a landscape or a flower, uh, you can fake it a little bit more. Things don't have to be exactly precise. Like if you're painting a building or a car or something like that, it's very specific or something that a lot of people have seen before and it's very obvious what it is um, and it's very complex. That can be, you know, daunting. But like something like a landscape, you can be as abstract with that as you want. You can be as realistic. Um, I like flowers because, you know, you can have them really loose and fluid or you can have them much more detailed and you know you can definitely your skill your you know how you paint can evolve and you can constantly be challenged by it but it I think it boils down to what you're the most interested in too so Katie asked I've got a folding palette and I've always seemed to be wasting paint any suggestions um wasting paint because you need to fold it up before you're done with it maybe is that do you think that's what she means I don't know, Joe asked if he's letting the paint fully firm up before closing it. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, let it dry open. Um, yeah, or you could maybe mix up less paint if you're finding that you're just having to clean off the wings and you've got tons of tons of paint in there. I want to have a little bit, I want to have a little white blossomy tree coming out of this area too. Yeah, I find, you know, if you, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll figure out how much paint you actually use in a painting, but that only comes with experience. And it's usually better to mix up more than you're going to need than trying to like match halfway through. Like if you're doing a sky, you want to make sure you have enough of that sky color already mixed up. Cause once you start painting it, you want to get it done or you're going to have streaks. So, you know, it's a good idea to just have that, have a little bit extra mixed up. And of course, sometimes you'll have something you'll have to wash off your palette. Uh, and also when you're learning how to mix, sometimes you go through a lot of paint and a lot gets wasted because it's, oh, well, that's a little too orange. I'm going to add a little more um, yellow to it. Oh, that's too yellow. I need to add a little more red. And you just kind of keep going back and forth and then you end up with a massive amount of paint. But that's going to, you know, that goes away the more you, pra you practice and just try to maybe mix up a little bit less than you have been if, if that's the issue why you're wasting the paint. Okay, I just want to few details in this pagoda here. You can do this with a white pen. You could leave it be if you like it, if you like the way it is right now. This is optional and um, like mine, I actually, it wasn't as, as like streaky or as um, runny as I thought it was going to be when I was painting it. I thought it was going to be a little more crazy. So I don't even really feel like I need a bunch of white definitions, but I'm going to put some in just because I think that, um, I think that that's, 
that I did on the first time I did it. So chances are you guys might need that as well. So I'm just going to put in very few details. I'm looking back and forth, back and forth at my reference and saying, okay, what, you know, what is an important detail? So I'm just thinking of the light, just kind of like the sun's going down the light is glinting across the tips of all these bushes, glinting across the edges of the architecture. What's it hitting? And that's how I'm deciding where I'm going to put any little marks. You know, I'll, 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 I'll like accent the ridge line or the um, the edge of a railing. I'll accent the where the teal and the red part of the building meet. I might just dab on the you know edges of a window. Can make a line that's gonna pull it away from the background. Lines that give a little contrast are nice. But I mean, I don't want to overdo it. I just want little bits of suggestion here. And I think that's all I'm going to do to that. I think that's uh, that's sharp enough. Maybe a little bit of a highlight up there. This isn't a terribly small brush either. It's a, you know, it's, you could use a pen if that makes you a little nervous. I want to do uh, this ridge line here. I kind of like getting lost in shadows. I think that's kind of mysterious. I wouldn't mind having the edge of this little building there though. Uh, this railing could use a little, just a little shimmer. And this is great to do at the end because, well, you wouldn't want to put white on in the middle um, because that can lead to, you know, you going over with stuff and ending up with mud. But it just kind of gives you that kind of like a little bit of sprinkle on the top and it gives you just some nice, uh, nice sharpness to it at the end. I'm going to highlight some rocks. I don't know if I like the highlights on the rocks because it looks too much like the, uh, I'm going to smudge them with my finger. It looks too much like the, the foliage. Um, maybe a little bit more bright yellow foliage here. Because I did some of that in the sketch and I like that. So I'm taking my Indian yellow, mixing it with my white gouache, and I'm just going to dab in some of that. Because that I think that, that creamy, buttery yellow that I have got going right here, just looks so good next to red and teal. I have, that's one of those combinations that I really love. It almost has a, like a homey kitcheny feeling too. It's just, I think what that's what it is. It's those homey colors that makes you kind of look like an old faded Polaroid. You know, you've got those kind of, you know, it just looks like nostalgia. This looks like somebody could have been somebody's vacation slide from, you know, 1975 that we're looking at here. And for very well, it actually could be, I mean, who knows? Question from Rose. What is white gouache? White gouache is an opaque watercolor, um, but it's much more opaque than white watercolor. It's um, uh, it's just a, an extremely white paint, and you can tint it with your watercolor. You can add it for highlights. Um, I never used to use white. I was one of those watercolors that was like, nope, not using white. That's cheating. I don't like it. Um, no, I think it's I think it's great to eliminate it from your palette unless you I just as long as you're using it deliberately, I think you're fine. I think if it's like an uh oh, I better get some white because I botched this, and that's fine too because it's better than throwing your painting in the fire pit. But um, learning how to get your whites and save your whites is very important, and it is a wonderful practice. And I did that for most of my watercoloring career. But you know, it's fun to use white. It's fun to to cut things out of your painting to like reach back in and be able to pull those highlights out again it's just it's just very enjoyable and um so I, I do it I like it but it's just a very opaque watercolor I'm adding a little bit of yellow highlights to the tips of these bristles branches can you use the same brushes for gouache and watercolor you can but if I'm doing like a just a plain gouache painting or um I'll show you some to remind me that I'll show you some at the end of the stream here that way, if people are just watching for the tutorial, they don't have to stick around. Um, but but when I'm doing just gouache, because I love using gouache on its own as a medium, I will use a slightly stiffer brush because I find that because gouache is, is a little bit thicker and more viscous, my softer watercolor brushes, which are meant to hold a lot of water and not so much thick pigment, just can't push it around very well. 
Um, so I do use like uh, small acrylic brushes like flats and filberts and I find that works extremely well. Okay, I think I'm gonna call this done. I mean, it's not fully dry. I'm gonna dry it real quick. If anybody has any last questions on this, just pop them in the chat. We have one from Maria. If you yeah. could only use, if you could only use brand of one brand of paint, probably from now on, what would you choose? Oh, if I could only use one brand of paint, what would I choose? Probably M. Graham. I don't. Daniel Smith is good. But I, I don't know. I just love M. Graham. I just want to make sure this is dry enough that there's no glare and you guys can see it real good. I don't see a glare. Yeah, I think I, I think I got it pretty good. And you know, if you, you know, it would also be cute to, um, or pretty to add some cranes. That would be very peaceful. That might be nice flying in the sky. You know, you can do what you want with your painting. I might do a little bit more of this tree. I love the texture in there, but I feel like I lost quite a bit of stuff by being being so drippy. So I might need a little bit of definition in there. If I do anything significant to this painting, I will update the blog post and I will. Um, put the you know final final painting in there so you can have a look um so let me grab my sketchbook with the gouache paintings uh, since somebody asked about that um and if any other questions come up maze you can you can uh send them to me here if anybody would like a sketchbook tour i certainly could do that in the future um so gouache is wonderful for doing like really uh, like stuff that has a lot of heft to it and you want a lot of weight to it. It's extremely vibrant. This is gouache. And the nice thing about gouache is that you can get by with really cheap gouache, like inexpensive gouache, like Arteza gouache is so affordable. And I really don't notice much working difference between that and M. Graham gouache, which is, you know, really high quality. I don't notice as much difference with a, with a cheaper gouache and more expensive gouache. That's not gouache. Uh, I think that one was gouache and colored pencil. That's gouache right there. So it just gives you, it's almost like it gives you the look of oil painting or acrylics a little bit more. Um, I guess this is mostly watercolor. I guess I do mostly watercolor, but I do have a few gouaches in here. And some watercolors from, like that's gouache right there. It's gouache and ink. That was really fun because you can layer up with it and you can get some really good textures with it. Uh, that had gouache, that was gouache and ink right there, that pizza. I like to paint food in gouache because it's so forgiving. Oh, that was watercolor. That was watercolor, gouache, and colored pencil. That was an unfortunate accident. Ah, this is gouache right here. So you can get kind of like an oil painting feeling and it's so, vel it almost feels like velvet. You get this velvety texture to it. It's very, very matte. So you can go over it with, um, with water cut with um with colored pencil you can go over it with uh all sorts of things and it photographs really well and it doesn't glare this i mean like actually i wouldn't spray gouache because it would probably give it a little bit of a sheen but it's just a really nice medium to work with it's easy on your eyes it doesn't glare like this is gouache here gouache and colored pencil Oh, and those all face sketches. I was doing, I, I sketched along with Becca Hilburn's channel. She did this expression video. It was really fun. So you can look her up. It's her channel, I think is called Natto Soup or it might be under Becca Hilburn. I'm not sure. This face is gouache. And this is, was the Zorn palette, um, which is the like ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, cadmium red, ivory black, um, and white. And so I was just playing with the Zorn palette there and seeing how it, how I liked it. Um, oh, that is gouache. So gouache is a lot of fun. It's quick. It's so quick. That was gouache and watercolor, I think. That was ink and gouache. So it's fun. It's quick. Oh, that was painted with that tiny little palette. This is going to be Sketchbook Sunday on Sunday. So look forward to that if you like figs, I guess. All right. Any more questions before we sign off tonight? Or are we good? I don't see any. All right. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Sorry about the audio problems at the beginning. Uh, big thanks to Maisie for being our moderator today. And thanks to the other moderators in chat. You are so helpful. Um, yes. It really keeps us a civil place. And a lot of places online aren't civil these days. So I do appreciate that. Please give me a thumbs up before you go. It really helps my channel. And if you are curious, oh, Maisie, would you pass me that stack of paintings that are right next to you? Um, if you're curious about my new watercolor landscape course, I'll give you a little preview of that. Um, there's a 50% off special going 
this month so my followers and subscribers get a um, get a discount um, so yeah you could save 50% it's regular 79 you'll get it for 39.50 here are the some of the real-time uh, long tutorials from the course uh, this one showing mountains and reflections how to capture reflections on a bright sunny day um, so you end up with some pre with some pretty paintings but you learn a lot of practical techniques this one was fun because I was really thinking about going to the beach when I was painting that yeah. one I love those colors um, I really enjoy painting this one and that really you see, you see a lot of scenes that have elements like this with the different types of trees and foliage and reflections in uh, misty skies and faraway mountains um, so you know there's a here, you can take that back there's a lot going on in that course and I think you'd find it useful if you want to learn to paint landscapes so that's uh, all I have for you today thank you so much for hanging out with me on this Friday evening and until next time happy crafting Bye. Bye.